Welcome to Lecture 10 of Ancient Philosophy. Hope you're enjoying this summer course. We are finishing up The Republic today. I hope you've enjoyed the reading from The Republic. Let's go ahead and jump into a review. So what we've seen in earlier books of The Republic is this argument responding to Thrasymachus and responding to Glaucon's and Edematus's question to show them that justice is profitable. Remember Thrasymachus thought that the goal is to acquire as much wealth and power because Thrasymachus is thinking this is the way to lead, lead the happiest life where you are able to satisfy all your desires. And for Thrasymachus, this requires living the unjust life, always looking to outdo another person. Glaucon and Edematus are still puzzled by Thrasymachus's challenge and they want, they want Socrates to show them that justice is indeed profitable. And so we spend a large part of the Republic talking about the nature of justice, looking at the ideal city, then applying that to the individual, and then seeing how justice is profitable. And then we saw in books five through seven, the development of the guardian's education and some of Plato's most interesting claims about metaphysics and epistemology, about what true knowledge is and how that knowledge is acquired and how philosophers alone have the ability to rule and how philosophers right, are able to have this ability in terms of the knowledge that they acquire ultimately in this experience that they have at age 50 with the form of the good. So we get the argument for the, that justice is harmony and justice is profitable. And what we've seen is that the ideal city aims for the greatest happiness of the entire city, not any individual part. And so we've seen how this works out in Plato's account. So each individual you know, has their own job to do, and that the governance of the entire city requires that everyone's, everyone is playing their part, everyone's performing their job. This will occur in a city when political leaders rule with knowledge and wisdom. This is the wisdom that's acquired through a thoroughgoing education that culminates with grasping the highest good and of course seeing how that highest good is interrelated to everything else. Similarly, in the, in the individual, the ideal individual, aims for the greatest happiness of the complete person. And Plato thinks this is going to happen when reason rules. So interestingly, what's going on with Plato's response in a way to Thrasymachus is Plato is arguing that Thrasymachus doesn't have a correct moral psychology. Thrasymachus is thinking that somehow or another this desire to outdo everyone else wouldn't be self-destructive. And Plato is presenting his view that given the nature of humans, given the nature of reason, given the nature of the appetites, given the nature of the honor loving parts of individuals, that if you have this unconstrained desire to outdo everyone else, then this will lead to destruction. So the ideal individual that achieves the greatest happiness is one where reason rules. And we'll see how this is filled out a little bit in these, these books as well. So reason here plays a special function in Plato's theory, both his political theory and his moral psychology, that reason governs based upon knowledge and ultimately upon knowledge of the form of the good. So in books eight and nine, what we'll see here is we will see Plato talk about different kinds of constitutions that fall away, in a sense, from the ideal kind of constitution, both for the state and the individual. So I did want to show you just here on the slide, we have in Greek at the top, Plato's Republic, so Platanos Politeon. Politeon there, Platanos, of course, is Plato. Politeon here is the word that we get, the word that we get the Republic from. Interestingly, it was, I believe it was Cicero that, that translated the Republic we translated Politeon into Race Publica, where we get the standard title for the Republic. Politeon is, we can think of this as, as, as forms of government or the ideal city. So when you think about the Republic, have that in mind, that this is a, this is a treatise on the form of the ideal city. So we move to book eight, and this is where Plato describes the fall away from the ideal city. What happens when the ideal city isn't maintained? And what we get is we get a picture of different kinds of constitutions. So if you look over on 554d, we have this conversation. So he said, you said, if I remember that there are four types of constitution remaining that are worth discussing, each with faults that we should observe, and we should do the same for the people who are like them. Our aim was to observe them all, agree which man is best and which worse, and then determine whether the best is happiness and the worst most wretched 
or whether it's otherwise. So they continue then to discuss these kinds of constitutions, and what he says, okay, well, what are these four constitutions? He says, well, that won't be difficult since they're the ones that, for which we have names. First, there's the constitution praised by most people, namely the Cretan or Laconian. The second, which is also second in the praise it receives, is called oligarchy, and it's filled with a host of evils. The next order, and antagonistic to it, is democracy. And finally, there is genuine tyranny surpassing all of them, the fourth and the last of the diseased cities. I'm not going to read through the detailed descriptions of each of these transitions. There is, I think, there's a lot of really fascinating information about uh, constitutions and about political change and about the human individual and about psychology. And I'll just let Plato speak for himself. But I do want to highlight the broad transitions and point, to, point you to particular passages. So one of the first questions that Plato addresses is how does the ideal city, the aristocracy, degenerate into democracy, into the city that is is doesn't the city that doesn't rule by reason, but rules by the honor loving parts of the city. He addresses this on 546. He says this it's hard for a city composed in this way to change, but everything that comes into being must decay. Not even a constitution such as this will last forever. It, too, must face dissolution. And this is how it will be dissolved. So Plato here is recognizing that even if the ideal city were to come into existence, that because it is part of the realm of becoming, it's going to devolve into a different kind of constitution. So he says, all plants that grow in the earth, and also all animals that grow upon it, have periods of fruitfulness and barrenness, both of both soul and body, as long as the revolutions complete the circumferences of their circles. These circumferences are short for the short-lived, and the opposite for the opposite. Plato's going to give a mathematical explanation for a really simple idea, but we'll get to that in a bit. Now, the people you have educated to be leaders in your city, even though they are wise, still won't, through calculation, together with sense perception, hit upon the fertility and barrenness of the human species, but it will escape them, and so they will at some time beget children when they ought not to do so. So I'll let you read the rest of the passage there. It's uh, 4 on 546. The basic idea is that the guardians have to rule on the basis of reason, of course, into the most, in, reason, of course, into the forms, um, and use that reason to pattern their city, but they also have to ensure that children are born in the next generation, and this is going to depend on information that they gain from that they uh, gain from sense perception. And some of that information is going to be incorrect. And that is going to lead the city to produce children that aren't the ideal children. And so there will eventually be a crop of leaders in the guardian class that aren't the cream of the crop. They aren't, you know, the gold standard. So Plato thinks this will lead to civil war. So reading now from 547, he says, once civil war breaks out, both the iron and the bronze types hold the constitution toward money-making and the acquisition of land, houses, gold, and silver, while both the gold and silver types, not being poor, but by nature rich, are rich in their souls, lead the constitution towards virtue and the old order. And thus striving and struggling with one another, they, compri they compromise in a middle way. So remember, Plato thinks that conflict within the city, civil war is the greatest evil for a city, and he sees this happening once this generation is born that right, isn't of the same ideal character as their ancestors or as their, as their parents. And thus striving and struggling with one another, they compromise on a middle way. They distribute the land and houses as private property, enslave and hold as serfs and servants those they previously guarded as free friends and providers of upkeep. And they occupy themselves with war and with guarding against those they've enslaved. So Plato thinks that this is where you get this middle constitution between an aristocracy and an oligarchy. So these honor-loving people will want honors, and so they will have a desire for private property and for possessions, which Plato thinks begins to corrupt the ideal city. So let's turn and look at what he says about the democratic person. So this is 549a. He'll be more obstinate and less well-trained in music and poetry, though he's a lover of it, and he'd love to listen to speeches and arguments, though he's by no means a rhetorician. He'd be harsh to his slaves rather than merely looking down on them as adequately as an adequately educated person. 
He'd be gentle to free people and very obedient to rulers, being himself a lover of ruling and a lover of honor. However, he doesn't base his claim to rule on his ability as a speaker or anything like that, but as he's a lover of physical training and a lover of hunting on his abilities and exploits in warfare and warlike activities. The model here that Plato has of the democratic city is much like Sparta, a war-like city-state that prizes victory and honor, very much an honor and shame kind of culture. So Plato next describes the rise of oligarchy and how in the democratic society, the love of honor and the love of possessions can lead one to value more and more possessions and so value more and more money-making enterprises. And so Plato, I'll let you read that. Plato you know, describes how oligarchy will come about. I do want to highlight a passage in his description of oligarchy on 552. So the question is, will the greatest evil for a city occur in an oligarchy? And the question is, well, what is that? And he says, allowing someone to sell, allowing someone to sell all his possessions and someone else to buy them, and then allowing the one who has sold them to go on living in a city while belonging to none of its parts, for he's neither a moneymaker, a craftsman, a member of the Calvary, or a hoplite, or but a poor person without means. So it's interesting here that Plato thinks this is the greatest of evil. This gets back to our remarks earlier in the Republic about the way wealth can divide a city into two cities or into a multiple of cities where you have you know, the constant economic strife and conflict between the money makers and then those that don't. In this individual, it's, it's someone who, who has given up all their possessions. So we can think of a modern analog here is sort of predatory practices by credit card or lending companies that they gradually promise possessions, but because of the high interest, end up the person is much worse off. So next Plato discusses the rise of democracy and he doesn't have a lot of really good things to say about democracy. The way he's thinking about it is he's thinking that everyone has an equal say in the direction of the city and that this is going to allow some people that do not have knowledge to direct the city which Plato thinks is just absurd because these people don't know what direction the city should go in, and yet he's thinking that in democracy, these people have the same ability, the same you know, political power to lead the city. And Plato thinks this is very destructive. So notice what he says about some of these values that we hold cherish, like freedom of speech. So he says, this is 557b, and isn't the city full of freedom and freedom of speech? And doesn't everyone in it have the license to do what he wants? That's what they say at any rate. And where people have this license, it's clear that each of them will arrange his own life in whatever manner pleases him. And we're thinking, yeah, what's wrong with that? And so he goes on, he says, and what about, what about the city's tolerance? Isn't it so completely lacking in small-mindedness that it utterly despises the things we took so seriously when we were founding our city? Namely, that unless someone had transcendent natural gifts, he'd never become good unless he played the right games and followed a fine way of life from early childhood. Isn't it magnificent the way it tramples all this underfoot by giving no thought to what someone was doing before he entered public life, and by honoring him, if only he tells them that he wishes the majority well? So Plato's thinking here is that by allowing every individual to do whatever it is that they want, they're not going to be governed by reason. They're going to be governed by different desires, appetites, and they're never going to be able to have the kind of training that's required to achieve the highest good. And Plato thinks that this eventually will lead to tyranny. So in 562 he describes the development of tyranny. So notice how he describes this. So 562a. So how does tyranny come into being? Doesn't it evolve from democracy much the way that democracy does from oligarchy? Well yeah. And isn't democracy's insatiable desire for what it defines as the good, also what destroys it. So there, it's the desire for whatever is conceived of as good is, is taken as key for democracy and the democratic person. There's no oversight to that. And what do you think it defines as the good? Plato says, freedom. Surely you'd hear a democratic city say that this is the finest thing it has, so that as a result, it is the only city worth living in for someone who is, by nature, free. Then, doesn't the insatiable desire for freedom and the neglect of other things change this constitution and put it in need of a dictatorship? I suppose that when a democratic city, a thirst for freedom, happens 
to get bad cup bearers for its leaders so that it gets drunk by drinking more than it should of the unmixed wine of freedom, then unless the rulers are very pliable and provide plenty of that freedom, they are punished by the city and accused of being accursed oligarchs. So Plato here is thinking that when you have as your only desire, your only when you have as your only good freedom, there are no constraints on that that allow an individual or society to say, no, these are the things that should be pr pursued and these are the things that should not be pursued. And Plato thinks that this incredible desire for freedom is eventually going to lead to where every demand that your appetites make upon you needs to be satisfied, and that is destructive to the integrity of the city and destructive to the individual. So we go to book nine where he's describing the tyrannical person. And so I want to look at this passage here on 571b. It says this, consider uh, some of our unnecessary pleasures and desires seem to me to be lawless. They are probably present in everyone but they are held in check by laws and by the better desires in alliance with reason. In a few people, they have been eliminated entirely, or only a few weak ones remain, while in others, they are stronger and more numerous. So this is Plato's, you know, again, vision of ideal rule by reason, because it eliminates or sort of tampen, tampens down these lawless desires. He says, well, what desires do you mean? Those that are awakened in sleep, when the rest of the soul, the rational, gentle, and ruling part slumbers. Then the beastly and savage part, full of food and drink, cast off sleep and seeks to find a way to gratify itself. You know that there is nothing it won't dare to do at such a time, free of all control by shame or reason. It doesn't shrink from trying to have sex with the mother, as it supposes, or with anyone else at all, whether man, god, or beast. It will commit any foul murder, and there is no food it refuses to eat. In a word, it omits no act or folly or shamelessness. So Plato thinks that the tyrannical person who has no sort of oversight on their desires that just acts upon impulse is driven into this, is driven to a psychology in which it's very difficult to see that there's any person left there. It's just a, a bundle of desires and has no uh, shame or no constraint from shame or reason. And he says, on the other hand, I suppose that someone who is healthy and moderate with himself goes to sleep only after having done the following. First, he rouses his rational part and feasts it on fine arguments and speculations. Second, he neither starves nor feasts his appetites, so that they will they will slumber and not disturb his best part with either their pleasures or their pains. But they'll leave it they'll leave it alone, pure and by itself, to get on with its investigations, to yearn after and perceive something. It knows not what, whether it is past, present, or future. Third, he soothes his spirited part in the same way. For example, by not falling asleep, with his spirit still aroused after an outburst of anger. And when he has quieted these two parts and aroused the third in which reason resides and so takes his rest, you know that it is then that he best grasps the truth and the visions that appear in his dream are least lawless. So Plato here is holding up a model of two kinds of persons. There's the tyrannical person that doesn't seem compelling at all, and then there's a person that is guided by reason. And this person seems really self-controlled and uh, seems much more to be a enjoyable individual than the tyr tyrannical person. So Plato continues here to compare, offer, really, he continues here to offer three comparisons of the just and the unjust life. So first we get a psychological profile. This is very similar to what we have already seen. He highlights that the tyrannical person is enslaved to desire. So if you look at 577d, you say, then, if man and city are alike, mustn't the same structure be in him too, and mustn't his soul be full of slavery and unfreedom with the most decent parts enslaved and with a small part the maddest and most vicious as its master. And so the tyrannical soul, he says, will also be least likely to do what it wants and forcefully driven by the stings of a dronus gadfly will be full of disorder and regret. So, you know, remember that Plato is writing the Republic in the fourth century BCE this is this theme this theme of sort of psychological this theme of psychological disintegration by letting your desires rule is a theme that works throughout western philosophy and western psychology this is a theme that you'll notice in a variety you know popular works like you know movies and books for example in cs lewis's the great divorce you get this picture of individuals progressing towards heaven and this means that they're progressing to become more and more of an individual more and more um, in control and, and more and more having greater moderation of their desires. In contrast, the people who and the people who are not on this road, this 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 growth to be a a real person, gradually dis diminish and fragment. 
and eventually come to nothing. So this is a theme, you know, that C.S. Lewis writes about it, but it's a theme that he's picking up from Augustine. And, you know, we can find in the Confessions, you know, very similar Platonic story. And this is a theme most likely that Augustine is picking up as well uh, from Plato. So the next comparison comes around this idea that the philosopher is the best judge of pleasure. So Plato in this section begins by distinguishing three kinds of pleasure corresponding to, to the different parts of the soul. So he says the first, we say, is the part with which a person learns, and the second, the part with which he gets angry. And as for the third, we have no one special name for it since it's multiform. So we named it after the biggest and the strongest thing in it. Hence, we called it the appetitive part because of the intensity of the appetites for food, drink, sex, and all the other things associated with them. But we also called it the money-loving part because of the appetites are most easily satisfied by money. Plato proceeds here to argue that we need a way of judging between the pleasures. He says on 582, how are we to judge things if we want to judge them well? Isn't it by experience, reason, and argument? How else would we have any better criteria than these? So consider then, which of the three men has most experience of the pleasures we mentioned? Does a prophet lover learn what the truth itself is like or acquire more experience of the pleasure of knowing it than a philosopher does of making profit? And Plato says there's a big difference between them. A philosopher has of necessity tasted the other pleasures since childhood, but it isn't necessary for a profit lover to taste or experience the pleasure of learning the nature of things that are and how sweet it is. Indeed, if he were eager to taste it, he couldn't easily have done so. Plato here is presenting the idea that a person who allows reason to rule has experienced right, the other pleasures and then is, a, is in a better position to judge which one's better. So you can think about it this way. I mean, imagine a person's trying to figure out, you know, which restaurant to go to, and they only go to Joe's Seafood Shack. Well, if you're trying to figure out which is the best restaurant to go, you want to pick someone that's been to Joe's, but you also want to pick someone that's been to these other restaurants as well. So this is Plato's sort of argument that the philosopher, in virtue of having reached the form of the good, the philosopher is able to sit back and evaluate which is the best pleasure. So the next argument that Plato gives to compare the just and the unjust life has this, has this really interesting idea. So he distinguishes between three kinds of states. There's the pleasurable state, pleasurable states, there are painful states, and then there's a calm in between. There's this intermediate state. And Plato thinks that we confuse the transition from pain to the calm state as pleasurable, and that is not a real pleasure. It's not a positive, enjoyable state. Similarly, Plato thinks that there's a confusion from moving from a pleasurable state to a calm state, that that amounts to pain. But Plato argues it's not. He argues that the removal of pains right, are not pleasures. And then he's going to argue that in many cases of these lower repetitive desires, when one is really hungry and that hunger is satisfied, that that's not pleasure, that's not pleasure itself, that that is just the removal of a pain. Of course, you know, eating a very fine, well-cooked meal is incredibly pleasurable. So it doesn't, uh, it not only, you know, removes hunger, but it provides very positive, uh, enjoyable, uh, gustatory experience. So there's this passage that I want to point you to on 586a, especially as you're thinking about, you know, the, especially as you're thinking about the allegory of the cave, you know, the form of reason, and, and the divided line. So Plato is here thinking about people who have not acquired, who have, well, let's just let him talk for himself. He's thinking about people here who he says have no experience of reason or virtue, but he says are always occupied with feast and the like and are brought down and then back up to the middle, as it seems, and wander in this way throughout their lives, never reaching, never reaching beyond this to what is truly higher up, never looking up at it or being brought up to it. And so they aren't filled with that which really is, and never taste any stable or pure pleasure. Instead, they always look down at the ground like cattle, and with their heads bent over the dinner table, they feed and fatten and fornicate. To outdo, remember again here, echoing back to Thrasymachus' idea that the goal is to outdo others, to outdo others in these things, they kick and butt, they kick and butt them with iron horns and hooves, killing each other because their desires are insatiable. For the part that they're trying to fill is like a vessel, full of holes, and neither it nor the things they are trying to fill it with are among the things that truly are. 
So at the end of book nine, he turns full circle to Thrasymachus' challenge, right? And he says there at the very end, 590, in light of this argument, can it profit anyone to acquire gold unjustly if by doing so he enslaves the best part of himself to the most vicious? If he got the gold by enslaving a son or daughter to savage and evil men, it wouldn't profit him no matter how much gold he got. How then could he fail to be wretched if he pitilessly enslaves the most divine part of himself to the most godless and polluted one and accepts golden gifts in return for a more terrible destruction than Irrefiles when she took the necklace in return for her husband's soul? So there is Plato's account that justice is profitable. So now we turn in the final book to Plato's attack on poetry. So book 10 returns to some of the themes that Plato explored in the Guardian, in the section on the education of the Guardians, in particular on, on mimesis, on imitation. And Plato here is arguing that poetry should not be a part of the ideal state, that it should be banned. So his basic argument is one that we should be familiar with by now, is that poetry imitates appearance. In virtue of imitating appearance, it appe appeals to the worst part of the soul, so poetry should be banned from the good city. So he gives a little sub-argument there that art imitates appearance, not reality. Reality is the object of knowledge grasped by the rational part of the soul, the mind that can reach out right, to the forms. So appearance, without so appearance without reality is going to appeal to the non-rational part of the soul, perhaps the senses and the desires. And so he thinks art appeals to the irrational in human beings, and that's why it should be banned. Now, Plato here just completely fails poetry class. This is something that Aristotle is going to point out. We'll, t we'll look at that in just a bit. But just look at his original argument that poetry imitates appearance. That's false. Poetry can aim to get at real presences. It can, it can aim to you know, create in us uh, appreciation and awareness of features of reality that we might not otherwise notice. Consider two as well. Poetry appeals to the worst parts of the soul. Really, Plato? I mean, that seems to be just utterly ridiculous. Have you ever been walking down the street and seen a po poet and thought, oh my god, I do not want to get mixed up with that person. They're just going to ruin me. So, I mean, poetry is, poetry is something that's to be celebrated. And this is something that Aristotle correctly points out. So Aristotle here, I just want to highlight this in the poetics. If we have time when we're talking about Aristotle, Hopefully we'll be able to see a little bit about his views on uh, poetry and fiction. So Aristotle says here, this is in section 9 of the Poetics. He says, it's moreover evident from what has been said that it is not the function of the poet to relate what has happened, but what may happen, what is possible according to the law of probability or necessity. The poet and the historian differ, not by writing in verse or in prose, the work of Herodotus, might be put into verse, and it would still be a species of history, with meter no less than without it. The true difference is that one relates what has happened, the other what may happen. Poetry, therefore, is a more philosophical and higher thing than history, for poetry tends to express the universal, history of the particular. By the universal I mean how a person of a certain type on occasion speaks or acts, according to the law of probability or necessity. And it is this universality at which poetry aims in the name she attaches to personages. So Aristotle is thinking that poetry, by this he's including like epic poetry and what we would consider just fiction, aims at revealing truths about individuals. And these are universal truths of, of kinds of character. And as anyone that has read a good book understands that fiction and poetry can be quite illuminating and oftentimes more illuminating than reading a you know, nonfiction book. We're done with the Republic. We have one more work by Plato that we're going to study, the Theotetus. Now the Theotetus, I think, it's one of my personal favorite philosophical books. I think it's one of the best philosophical books, period. So we're going to spend next week studying the Theotetus. We're going to get some really fascinating, thought-provoking arguments about, about reality, about knowledge, about the way memory works, about the aim of philosophy. So looking forward to talking to you about the Theotetus.